Hello, everybody. We are finally live. Thank you for bearing with us here. Give a couple of minutes. Hopefully a new notification went out. Uh, let's see who's in the chat with us. Let me scroll up. Heather, Ann, thank you for being here. Kelly, Minnie, Percy, Christina, Mary B, Deidre. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's really nice. And Holly XO, hello, love. Um, Sorry about uh -oh. that. Okay. <laughs> um, tonight we have Nathan Forrest Winters with us and Sharice is helping. She's on the panel too. And we're going to have Nathan tell us about his story. He had a documentary that came out in the end of October, right, Nathan, or beginning of November? Yeah, October 31st, I think was officially it was available, yeah. Okay. And let me know if you guys can hear him okay. His headphones broke. Um, so you might have to turn your volume up. I'll try not to speak in my normal loud voice so I'm not overpowering your eardrums. Um, but as long as you guys can hear him, that's the... Uh, you just might have to turn your volume up a little bit or put some headphones in. So let's go ahead and start, Nathan. Do you want to um, introduce yourself and give everybody a little bit of background? Uh, sure. My name is Nathan Forrest Winters. Um, I was an aspiring child actor, um, and that was that dream was kind of realized, almost realized, um, when I was introduced to someone named Victor Salva, and I ended up starring in two of his films. And uh, the part of that that's, I guess, been so, um, you know, on everybody's minds or wanting to know is, is the fact that he's a pedophile and he uh, sexually abused me from ages 6 to 12. And um, so the movie that I started in that uh, it never saw the light of day and I told my mom, and that's why the movie was never released uh, officially in theaters or anything, but... Um, and, you know, have been basically learning to survive in the wake of um, since, and uh, he went on and he was he was convicted um, on five of the least severe charges out of eleven. Um, was sentenced three years. He served, you know, a little less than half that, and uh, fifteen months, right, to be exact. Yeah, fifteen months to be exact. Unreal. Yeah. In like a treatment center in Napa Valley, California, it's not like he went and did a hard time. He was, you know, being he was in a treatment center, which I guess is neither here nor there, you know, to some degree. But um, it just kind of shows. It helps. The reason I bring that up, I guess, is because it helps to um, solidify and show like just how uh, protected and sheltered, you know, they are in Hollywood. If you're in that industry and and um, are in that group, you know, in that special elite group that you know, I, so. He basically had a, you know, his career waiting for him when he was released and has gone on to make, you know, several films in Hollywood, including like uh, the Jeepers Creeper franchise. And in uh, 96, I think um, a subsidiary of Disney hired him, gave him $10 million to make a movie called Powder, starring Jeff Goldblum, Sean Patrick Flannery, Mary Steenburgen. And um, so at 20, when I heard about that, it was uh, not on my watch kind of a thing, you know, where it's just like, I'm, he's not going to be allowed to be paid by, you know, the biggest, um, biggest company in the world that's, you know, all about children or supposedly all about children, um, without me at least saying something about it. So and it's interesting, just as I'm making the decision, I was at work at the time and I'm like making this decision, like, am I going to go? And I'm just thinking, okay, I'll go to like the no local, you know, Fox news or, or something, you know, and, uh, see if anybody wants to run a story about it and that's when I got a call from the Associated Press and uh, somebody had tipped them off to call me so you know the next several months I was just you know being turned inside out and flown all over the country to raise awareness and protest the fact that you know he Disney hired this convicted pedophile to make a, a film whose target audience by the way was boys 12 to 17 so wow yeah, so, you know, I, I did that until I couldn't do it anymore to, or until the media was basically, you know, on to the next story of the week, flavor of the week, whatever you want to call it, and um, had continued just to be 
there anytime he's on the radar and there's a possibility children are involved in his films, I have been there to step up and remind everyone of just what he's done and the fact that um, he's legally, you know, not able to be around anyone under, under the age of 18, period. So and it seems like, you know, that's something that people need to be reminded of constantly because uh, he's, you know, had access to children as far as I know, like Jeepers Creepers 2, there was somebody under the age of 18, um, I think the boy in the first opening of the film was underage. You know, do we know if he was on set or on the, you know, like during that scene being filmed? No, but, you know, just the fact that this boy under 18 was in this film is, is enough for me to stand up and remind everyone again of, you know, who he is and what he's done. So what was like the reason? Well, actually, we'll get to that. Um, when I was listening to your documentary, you met Victor at a daycare. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It's actually, the only job other than being a filmmaker that I've ever known him to have was involved with either like the uh, Big Brothers group or YMCA or a daycare center. Okay, and then like your mom was going to make props for a movie, like a goblin head for the film? Yeah. Okay, and then it went from there. Um, I heard you talked about, I wanted to ask you, and then you stayed at his house? Was this when he was trying to cast you for a movie, or how did, well, was that when you were six, when you first met him? The way that, the way that you know, pedophiles, typically operate is they're very very they're like master manipulators and uh so yeah. whatever it was you know like when he was my mom was helping him with his film goblin's gold um you know like i was allowed to go and see you know certain aspects of it being shot and um you know as i said like i, I as a little kid i always wanted to act or perform in some way you know and um so i was very very interested in it and you know, whatever it is he saw in me, he saw a target, you know, he saw an easy target, I think, or I know, actually. Um, and so he became friends with our family and, you know, built a, he spent like the first better part of a year of knowing him, developing that relationship with my parents and, and getting their trust and right. uh, developing love and trust with me. And um, so... You know, it, it just started out like gradual, like kind of thing. Like if you need a break or, you know, well, you guys want to go out sometime, I can take Nathan and watch him. And, you know, because at the time, my brother, uh, who's five years younger than me, wasn't really, you know, he's like two years old. And um, so it was more, it was me. He wasn't asking to ask my infant, you know, to watch my infant and toddler brother. He was, you know, offering to watch me. And so... It would start out just like he'd watch me for a night and, you know, and then within a, you know, a couple of years of the relationship, my parents trusted him, you know, much more. So, you know, there are things like, it'd be like, okay, well, I'll take Nathan overnight and we can go, you know, to this amusement park tomorrow and go out to pizza tonight. And it was like this whole, you know, uh, sort of Disneyland dad kind of, you know, part of the term, but that kind of a, a relationship where, you know, I kind of, uh, my dad relationship in mine was, was pretty rough and um so i i was craving and seeking that like male attention and so that was all right so it was, like i said i was an easy target for him you know so they look for him in children with the children that have problems at home or are you know already being victimized because it makes it that just that just that much easier for them to manipulate the child so um you know eventually it turned into where i'd go and stay the whole weekend and you know Within the first year is when it, they, the abuse really started. So um, it's very gradual, of course. Wow. Um, Nathan, just real quick, is there any way to turn up your volume or for you to get a little bit closer to where your microphone is? I can hear you okay, but I have headphones in and I have it blasted. Just a couple people asked. Okay. I'll try to okay. pick up too. better. Yeah, it seems better for me, um, for sure. <clears throat> so um, uh, there was something that you were talking about in the documentary where uh, Victor's boyfriend came over and they asked you to hide under a bed. 
Was this before the abuse or was that how it started or? The abuse. That was probably, I'd say, three years into it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Thought his, he, you know, he thought that his boyfriend might be uncomfortable uh, if I was there while they were making out. So they, he had, they had me hide under the bed. Now, did his boyfriend abuse you too? Did he partake in that or was it just Victor? It was just Victor. Wow. Do you think his boyfriend knew about it? I'm going to say no. I don't think he did because I don't remember that boyfriend being around very long. Like, I think I only met him twice. You know, um, according to like Vic, some of Victor's close friends and, and one of the men that um, worked on the set, he was like the set designer, I think, in uh, for Clown House, which was the film that I starred in, um, had said that Victor con confessed to, and confided in him that he was in love with me. So, you know, I don't think Victor was very interested in adult males his age so his boyfriends were never really around if he had them wow and the abuse started when you were six years old right nathan yeah was between it six and seven you know because of the grooming process that took time you know he didn't just start abusing me it was, it was a process Right. Oh, yeah, because that's what they do. They want to gain your trust and your parents' trust and everything else. Mainly the love of the child, because that's why the child, that's why the children most like more often than not don't come forward and tell, because they love the person that's abusing them, you know, when it comes to these kinds of situations. Yes. Or fear. It's either love or fear that they use. All right, then do you want to talk about a little bit about <clears throat> how the charges became about? Because, um, well, I wanted to talk about, like, I was going to ask, were you relieved that, uh, because I heard in the documentary, because Victor talked so much that you didn't end up having to testify in court. You want a little talk about, like, how everything came, of a, came to a head and how charges were filed? Um, yeah, so my mom, I... She'd had her suspicions for a while. Um, they were growing. And uh, just because of the way that, you know, we interacted. And um, during the filming of Clown House, you know, Victor was like kind of at the height of his sickness with me, I guess. And so he was like very jealous and very like overly protective of me during, you know, shooting. And, you know, there were times where like uh, during one of the scenes, uh, my older brother hit one of the clowns in the head with a two by four and I like I'm on my hands and knees behind the clown you know to kind of make him fall over behind him and when we shot that scene the clown was so heavy that my head smacked the my forehead smacked the the hardwood floor and so you know I like held my tears and as soon as he said cut I like jumped up and started bawling and ran and jumped in his lap and it was like this you know very inappropriate you know, seen here. And so it started making the crew like kind of suspicious and, and you know, curious about what was really going on. And, and a few of them went and kind of told my mother that, that like, you know, their interaction is not normal for a director and child star to be like, you know, that's not normal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so my mom kept pressing and kept pressing. And it was within the first week of after we wrapped shooting, um, it took 30 days to shoot the film. And then we had like a week or two off. And then we had to go back to um, Coppola's house. He, he produced the film and funded it. And uh, like more than half the scenes were shot at his house up in Napa Valley. And um, so we had to go back to his house to do all the dubbing because the cameras we used for that film were extremely old and outdated. They're the same cameras actually that were used to film American Graffiti. They were loaned to us to, to shoot that film. So. I mean, there's ridiculously loud, like clack, 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 to the point where every bit of sound had to be dubbed over. And it was within that break, the lull in between the, the filming and the dubbing that my mom pressed me and I just, I broke down. I couldn't, I couldn't keep the lie anymore. Right. And, and I just couldn't lie about it anymore. And I wanted it to stop, you know, I, um, and so I told my mom and uh, the police set up a sting and he was getting, he had left at like 6, 6.30 or something in the morning to go drive up to Coppola's property. And uh, 
that's when the that's when the cops got him and he was caught completely unaware and so they just you know they found stacks and stacks of like uh photo albums full of you know half nude and naked boys and clippings from newspapers and magazines of boys modeling underwear and and you know his own personal kitty porn collection um that had several videotapes of in it and i mean they just he was caught completely unaware so there was there was 11 charges total that were filed on him originally and once he was, wow. arrested, once he was arrested coppola went and um got him this high price you know hollywood money lawyer and that bought him that short sentence that he got that and the fact that my lawyer sold us out so. okay um i have a question actually about coppola are you let me ask you real quick nathan just because people in the chat are you on your phone right now with your camera i am okay do you want to maybe try to turn off your camera and just hold your phone like we're talking on a phone call because then you'd be speaking right into the mic because i think the audio wait try talking again Hello, is that better? Hello. Oh, yeah, much better. Yeah. <laughs> Let's yes, ask yeah, that. So much is better. Is that better, chat? It's good. They're on a little bit of a delay, but um, uh, it sounds better to me. Does it sound better to you, Sharice? Yeah, it sounds better to me. Oh, Mary said much better. Okay. okay. Um, now, Nathan, when you said you, they went to his house and they found the, all this child pornography and stuff, do you believe, like, was there other victims? Do you know? Um, that was never disclosed. If there were any there, it's it's unknown. Um, okay. Because I'm the only one that came forward with testimony. Okay. I was oh, just that, curious. Was, there, was one, there was one videotape that was found um of my co-star in both films that i was in of his brian McHugh, um uh where victor had set up his video camera inside a, a basket of uh, dirty laundry in the bathroom and hit it and filmed brian taking a shower wow but there's there's there was the evidence suggested and and basically that he was uh involved in you know uh exchanging kitty porn child pornography wow and so the coppola guy sharice is that who you told me is the uncle of nicholas cage, cage? yes and he was friends with victor salva he mentored victor salva right nathan yeah basically um we filmed the first film we did was the short called something in the basement that I starred in and uh, that was entered into a film festival in San Francisco and Coppola was on the panel of judges for, uh, I guess it was sci-fi or suspense or something. I don't know exactly which category it was in, but it won first place. And so that, you know, and, and let me just put this out there too, that this film was evaluated by an expert and within the 28 minute length of it, there was like, I don't know, like anywhere from 18 to like 30, um suggestions suggestive scenes that were like you know the huge red flags of sexual abuse and like the glorification of like you know this homoerotic sexual child abuse so and he has that in a lot of his films it's it, all of his films are, he can't keep it out yep. he cannot keep it out of his films and this one was just off the charts you know as well as clown house off the charts they would not allow Clown House to be to be viewed by an expert. Um, somehow Coppola, you know, was able to weed a lot of that through the contract or something. I'm not entirely sure because I was so young and going through such trauma at the time. I, you know, I, I just didn't, I wasn't privy to that kind of information, I guess. And, um, but this film won first place and that's when Coppola approached Victor and said, you know, let me give you some money, make a, you know, a full length film and um, I'll produce it. And we'll distribute it through my American Zotero pictures. Wow. And Pondra um, was made through Disney. What, I mean, what? when you really think about that, you know. No, Powder was made by Caravan Pictures, which is which is a subsidiary of Disney. That's why I stepped up at 20 and was like, I don't think so, you know, because this is here's Disney giving us convicted pedophile 
$10 million to make a movie targeted towards boys 12 to 17. So it was, Did your you know, family support you when you protested powder? Absolutely. Yeah, they. I mean, all over, you know, family all over were at, at the theaters playing powder protesting with pickets. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> all right. Well, I'm going to go a little bit back to what some stuff you were saying in your documentary. You talked about like through kindergarten and sixth grade that you were bullied. And then I think after the print, the, I couldn't believe it, that the newspaper actually printed your name publicly as a child in this case. And then you had to switch schools like five times. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Yeah. Our local paper, um, the Contra Costa Times, which is East Bay Area, uh, printed my name seven times in a side article, side page article. And how old were you at this time, just to let the viewers know? I was 12. Okay. Wow. Um, that basically, that happened over the summer in between sixth and seventh grade. So by the time I got to school in seventh grade, you know, it was nothing but like, it was just, it was the worst one of the worst things I ever went through as a child and um, Terrific. being taught, being taught, you know, just, just berated constantly all day with comments and being beat up and, you know, like anything you can think of, the worst thing you can think of, I've been called, you know, so it's one thing it's developed a very thick skin. So, um, but yeah, it was, it was bad. It was, I had to go to five different schools because of it. Unreal. <clears throat> oh. High school too like every once in a while in high school somebody would you know recognize me or recognize the name and and like start spreading shit with people and and um but it was fewer and far between and as i got bigger and older it was you know not as easy to plus i had you know a couple of really close friends that if somebody said something like that around me that they weren't having it either well that's good um now wasn't there something like did they sue your family for five million dollars yeah or yeah. So who sued your family, Victor, or the production company? Hopefully, did yeah. He filed a five million dollar lawsuit against us for some breach of contract. He, you know. Wow, how did that end? Did it get dismissed and thrown out? Um, he dropped the the he dropped the um, lawsuit on Christmas Eve. Unreal. Un unreal. Um, who was the first person that you told about your abuse and how did that person react? Was it your mom? It was my mom and I, you know, I don't remember how she reacted. I just, I, the only thing I really remember is that we were in the kitchen and I told her and uh, I think she did her best to keep it together. But I, knowing my mom and, and you know, knowing how I would react if my son came and told me something like that. Um, I can imagine she, she did her best to hold it together. Yeah. And then I'm sure it was a whirlwind after that because the police were contacting and everything. And I give you, um, it took a lot of strength of you, Nathan, to do what you did yeah. when you were a child and what you're still continuing to do. I know I spoke to you very, very, very briefly on the phone the other day and, um, told you a snippet apart about my abuse <clears throat> and I did not tell anybody. My best friend knew years after it happened, but that was it. And then the first person I told was the father of my children after I had my daughter and his react, he responded very, very poorly um, to the point that I never even told anybody um, again, up until about two years ago when I got involved with this Corey Feldman stuff and met, you know, a group of girls and we were all sharing our story privately. And then, you know, I spoke to Bobby about it too. And I've been wanting to talk about it um, publicly here. And I think I'm going to, you know, do that one day. Um, I wanted to actually, I thought about something today, but I'll talk to you about that on the phone. I thought maybe you and I could do that because I would like somebody to interview me about it. And I thought maybe how awesome it would it be if you could do that because you could probably help me a lot. But like no one in my family really knows. My sister, I, she knows, but she doesn't know all the details and everything, but that's about it. So it takes a 
a lot of courage for you to do that at 12 years old and then to start that campaign all over again as an adult. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was amazing of you. For me, uh, when I was 12 and Victor was arrested and once it was done and he was convicted, I wrote him a letter and um, it wasn't until years later when he was doing powder and I had to go to my attorney and get the all, you know, all the files from him um, for various reasons or whatever, that I found this letter I'd written him um, that my lawyer kept a copy of. And in that letter, I told him that if I ever found out of him having the opportunity to do this to another child, to another little boy, that I would be hit there to stop him every time. And when I read that at 20, because I didn't remember writing it. And when I read yeah. that at 20, it like, it just, it floored me. And I, I knew that, you know, this has never been a conscious choice. It's what has to be done, regardless of the cost emotionally or financially or anything else. To me, this has to be done because someone has to be willing to put themselves on the line for the other children. Right. Well, so well, Nathan, Nathan, were you aware that Victor actually had two films in the works? And since you came forward, they've actually stalled. He had a movie called The Old Hag Syndrome. It was going to be a horror movie. I did read about that one. Yeah, and that th they basically stopped working on that in uh, May 2017. And the other one was Javelins of Light. And that's another one that, um, you know, he did Jeepers Creepers 3 in 2017 and had two more films lined up. And both of those just... Um, stopped no i had no idea about i i remember um connor was the one that found something about old hag syndrome and so we kind of you know like looked into it a little bit but i i that was the last i heard of it so i and then you know maybe a year ago or so connor and i kind of were talking and and uh but just to specify connor is the director of my documentary connor fraser um, so we're kind of talking about it and he's like, I haven't heard anything about that. So I don't know what happened to it. Maybe they bagged it. So. Well, they yeah. definitely uh, stalled. And, um, do you want to speak out about Rose McGowan working with him? Um, well, I mean, what, all I've really had to say about Rose is that, and on, I'll try to, you know, be as uh, polite as I can about it, but I think that anything and everything she's had to say thus far has been extremely uh, ignorant sounding and that it would have been better just to keep her mouth shut than to have said what she said. How do you feel about the Me Too movement and Rose being a leader of that while at the same time working with Victor Salva and never giving you an apology? Oh, she works with that guy still? No, she made a movie with him. Wow. See, I, I don't know much about all this. So I, yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah. Nathan, go ahead. Right. Rose McGowan, the leader of me too. <laughs> yeah. And she starred in a Vic, in one of Victor's films called Rosewood Lane. And, um, she's very, very dismissive. She's just like, Oh, well, you know, it didn't really concern me. So I didn't really, you know, care about it basically. And <laughs> it's been nothing but nice and sweet to me on set, like kind of attitude towards it. As her being in, Involved or a leader in the Me Too movement, I don't think that um, she's helping that movement uh, to see that to see what it, you know, the the potential that it could, if they had somebody a little bit more stable and, um, you know, sort of compassionate and intelligent. You know, right. Um, didn't let some things pass. I, I I didn't know about any of that, but it kind of reminds me of. Uh, and I hate to bring his name up, but Feldman, how, you know, he had sexual intercourse um, with a woman when he was a minor and the woman was an adult. And he, you know, has said publicly, oh, well, you know, it's OK, because at that time I was, you know, wanted a girl, a woman to touch me. And it's like, well, no, wrong is wrong. Right is right. And, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's kind of. Well, that's just a another instance of somebody that doesn't have the capacity or intelligence to really um, be talking about what they're talking about, you know? That's right. I, and that's as polite as I can be about it. It's, it's just, to me, it shows a, a very 
um, specific degree of ignorance or, you know, lack of like compassion or, you know what I mean? It's like, to me, that's that both, both Feldman and Rose McGowan, the way they are so dismissive of it. And so <laughs> it, they're, they just, it's like, they're cold hearted. They have, you know, there's no, there's no compassion there. There's no human, you know, it's like, I don't yeah. know. It's, it's hard, to, you know, but um, I have to do something. I have to go get my charger because my my phone's about to die. I got the ten percent. So can you guys just give me like you know ninety seconds or something? To oh yeah, sure. 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 No problem. Go ahead. I'll be right back. Okay. Um. Well, this would be a great time if anybody in the chat has any questions that they would uh, like me to ask, please. Uh, or to ask Nathan, please. Go ahead and put your question in the chat. Maybe put like hashtag Suzy Q on it so it highlights it a little bit. Um, hold on one second. Somebody else was supposed to join us, and I believe they just sent. sent oh yeah, the Susan won't let her. Join. Well, that'd that, be good for her to come on now too. Huh? Well, she's saying it's not letting her on for some reason. Um, do you want to try to send it to her on Messenger, Kelly, if you're listening? We can try to – can you do that for me, Cherise? Yeah. Um, send her the link. I, apparently she sent us an email too. Um, but if anybody in the chat has any questions that you would like to ask, uh, Nathan, please ask. And I would also like to give credit to Heather Harris. She helped me today. Um, get together some of the questions that I've already asked. So thank you, Heather, for doing that. Um, she can hear, but can't get on. Well, I don't have her backstage. I'll send it. Okay. So uh, um, Lucy Love, I saw your comment earlier. I believe it was yours and you asked if I was a victim of uh, abuse, and I was of sexual abuse. <clears throat> it's something that I haven't really spoken about publicly. Um, I've been wanting to. I was going to do it with Bobby at one point, and then kind of just did it. And then JT and I talked about doing it too, and then kind of just did it. But um, really no reason to. It's not something that, you know, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, today I want to do that. But <clears throat> it is, um, I have been, this one good thing that's come out of this whole crazy Feldman everything campaign is because I have, I didn't speak about my abuse at all for many years after telling the father of my children. And I was able to talk to a lot of the um, girls that are in this chat right now and probably some that are listening, I was able to open it up. They, you know, shared their stories with me and it gave me the strength to be able to share my story with them. Um, you know, everybody's story is different and I think we can all learn from everybody's story, you know, um, and get strength from each other. And, you know, I think that's great. Um, uh, all right, good question. Most, most like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go on. No, go ahead. No, 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 go on. No, I'll I'll gotta wait for Nathan back to back. um ask this question. Okay. You guys uh, yeah. Okay. Can you hear us? Yep. Okay, I have a question from Heather Harris. She says, how does he feel that now if someone doesn't like someone, they're called a pedophile? It's the new thing. Um, how do I feel about... Well, I think she's talking about, like, a lot of times you'll see on social media, like, when somebody gets upset with someone, they'll just be like, oh, that person's a pedophile, even though, you know, they don't have convictions on them or... You know, I had it done with people that were upset upset with me on the internet. They were calling my husband a pedophile. And, like, that just seems like that word is kind of thrown around very loosely these days. Um, I think that is, is something that maybe people are doing unwittingly 
uh, or they do know, but I think that will lend to um, sort of downplaying it, I guess, in a way, because if it's just so common, then, you know, like, I, I don't agree with it. I think that's extremely wrong, and that's not any kind of thing that you should ever throw around. It's like calling someone a rapist or a you know, right. uh, real killer or, I mean, it's right. That's not something that should just be used lightly or taken, you know. Um, so I don't agree with it at all. Not yeah. Even, and I I think that it adds it it will lend to sort of you know something that in my opinion um, many of the powers that be are trying to normalize pedophilia. They want to make it so it's okay and it's acceptable. And um, I think that would end up lending to it. In fact by making it just such a loose term that people are throwing around or, you know, and even that it's going to, it could ruin people, you know, exactly. people that, are not, that are not, you know, molesters or pedophiles could just completely ruin them. It can just destroy somebody's life. Okay. Percy, she goes by the brutal Pope chaos. She asks, does Nathan believe any of this will ever stop in Hollywood? Um, I think that there is an there is a possibility that well I don't know I mean stop what does she mean by stop I guess it's like you know are we going to be able to stop people from murdering other people or you know what I mean it's like we can right it's a, it's, a, it's it goes outside of Hollywood too you know you know and I, I unfortunately I feel like that industry is just saturated with it and it, it truly is just you know it's so rampant in that industry that to completely clean out that industry we would not have very many you know like it might be the end of hollywood which i don't really have an issue with but you know i mean people do crazy things to protect you know to protect it's just i don't think it's something that um it's hard to that's a hard one to answer well, do you think, let me, because I just thought of this now as we're, as you're talking, do you think now with everything that happened with the Me Too movement and the Harvey Weinstein that more people have their eyes open and their ears opening and not so much blinders? Because I would think, but I've never been in the industry. So, I mean, I would think with everything that happened with that, and everything that's happened since then, you know, with Nickelodeon and everything else, Open Secret, all of it, I think it would be like, not only would eyes be more open and be looking for things and looking for signs, but maybe now more people would actually say something. Or do you still think it's going to be like how it was, you know, when you were a child and, um, other actors when they were a child where it's kind of hush hush i would think or at least maybe it's just i want to hope that it would be more where people might feel more comfortable to say something about it now where in the past they wouldn't and also yeah. also maybe the people who are the pedophiles and the abusers would kind of wisen up and not do it as much i, I don't know how to word that correctly but do you know what i'm trying to say you actually you clarified the question um, for me considerably so um, and you made some really good points and I, and I agree with them uh, but again you know in my experience it's not necessarily something that's um, like they can just be like one day be like oh I'm not gonna be you know attracted to kids anymore and I'm not gonna try to go pursue that um, in most instances and so you know, I think that it's definitely going to push them farther underground and it could, you know, it could go that direction where it's going to make it much more difficult for them to be caught. Hmm. Um, they'll have to be more clever. But I definitely think that the time has, it's going to be, it's nothing like it was when I was a kid or even when I was 20 and I was protesting powder. You know, right. it's nothing like that. So it's definitely the, all the, the awareness that's being raised is going to help out considerably. Um, you know, one of the other biggest tools to fight it, I think, it might, is education, learning to look for the signs, what the signs are, if your child's being abused or if someone is pursuing your child or, or preying on your child um, is a huge thing. And I think that the children should be taught 
It should be something that they're taught from a young age, you know. Absolutely. Sort of yeah, definitely. Included, you know, to teach them what to, you know, if somebody's, if they, it's not as if they don't, they may all be different, but they all have very similar tactics and, and ways that they go about manipulating the child and the parents. So um, that's, you know, to me, that is prevention. Education is prevention. If we want to stop this, then we have to educate ourselves and be willing to fight for it. And one of the biggest issues in our culture is this mentality that we they seem to have adopted where it's like, not my child, not my problem. And mm. people turn a deaf ear and a blind eye to it. And that cannot happen anymore. You know, people have to start up and start fighting for the children because, Absolutely. you know, basically, it's, to me, we've thrown them to the wolves and we're they're going to inherit nothing but, a you know, a shit storm. That, why would they want to do anything to save it? You know, because look at what we're leaving them. And we're not even protecting them. Right. So, you know, if we want it to stop, if we want to protect our children, then we need to be better educated and willing to stand up and fight. You know, I mean, I've, I've been had death threats of my family's been harassed. I mean, it's been a really, you know, it's been a really tough road, okay? And most people would have, you know, cried off by now. You know, I've had millions of dollars offered to me at, at certain times in my life. Wow. And they, you know, I mean, you wouldn't believe the offers that I've had, the threats that I've had, you know, and they can't silence me and they cannot buy me. And that's why Hollywood is as afraid of me as they are, because I am not one that will be bought. And I am not one that will be a be cry off because of fear. So, I, have a, I have a question, too. Um, Nathan, in all of the years that everybody has known your story, known the case, known that Victor is a convicted pedophile, um, with all the media that's reached out to you over the years, how many have, have reached out to you and said, I want to help you spread your story? How many what? Celebrities. How many uh, actors? None. No actors, no actresses, all of the Me Too movement, all these people. Not one. Not one? Not one. Why do you think that is? Because I'm like a boogeyman or something, possibly. Or because, I don't know, I mean, Coppola literally blackballed me and said it to me, like, you'll never work in this industry again when I was 12. <clears throat> so I don't know. I don't know how that carries over. I don't know exactly the workings of their little society, but... You know, I do know that I have had nothing but, um, I've, met, I've met, I've been met with nothing but like uh, obstacles and about anything you can imagine, you know, to prevent me from seeing any kind of success with this. Um, Kennedy Jane Beauty asks, how is Victor Salva allowed to still direct with underage children in them? <laughs> That's probably the million dollar question or one of the million dollar questions. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer because, again, um, like with powder, for instance, one of the biggest things with that, with that, you know, being blowing up like a powder cake in the media was uh, there were reports coming back from the dailies and stuff about how, you know, it was, a, it was such a comfortable and relaxed set and such a nice atmosphere with children and dogs running all over the set and how Victor would, you know, it was such a sweet guy and such a good director and he's even seen you know eating most of his meals at the children's table so um wow. now none of it can be proven none of it can be you know it's not like we can go press charges for this because it's, you know this is long before the internet was like a thing so right. um you know and they've done everything they can I, I believe to bury any kind of evidence or any kind of support for me you know like if you try to go and find any of my interviews, like video interviews, because I was, when I did that at 20, I literally was on, like, I don't even know, it was, there's countless interviews that I did, seven months worth of interviews, and being pulled in every direction, you know, and um, you can't find any of them. So, yeah, I was going to say, I didn't know that, and I don't ever remember hearing anything about it, so, I mean, that's crazy. Two articles that were written since all of that that people were able to find. That's it, too. So, I mean, that suggests to me that they're doing whatever they can to bury it. Yeah, unreal. Uh... The, truth is, the truth is, is 
that prior to me doing that at 20 years old, no other man had ever done that in history. Something like that. Willingly. I know. That's, that's amazing. And, and so it's a very scary thing because I have a conviction. I have actual proof and evidence of him being a pedophile and being coddled and supported throughout in, pet, in Hollywood. And that, I think, scares Hollywood to death. I have yeah. a, another question real quick. Um, if you had the chance to speak to Victor Salva, would you? Nathan? I don't know if you me. I just lost audio. Oh, okay. Go oh, ahead. I, I, I asked okay. if, um, if you had the chance to speak to Victor Salva, would you? Or what would you say? I don't know that I would have anything to say to him, honestly. I, I mean, I don't know that I would. I really don't. I mean, yeah. I've never thought, of, to be completely honest, I don't, I don't think I've ever thought about meeting him or seeing him again or speaking with him again. So it's not anything that I've ever really kind of, you know, entertained that thought in my mind to see where it would go or what I would want to say. You know, he's never apologized. He's never, I mean, he's done everything he could if it's been brought up in an interview to downplay it, lie about it, and move past it and talk about his, you know, upcoming film career as a director and writer. So I don't think he has any desire to talk to me or ever see my face again. I think I'm like, his, you know, I'm like that thorn in the side that won't ever go away. I think they right. he just wishes I would, or I would die or, you know, lose my tongue or something. Have you, you ever you considered a civil suit against him? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hear you. What? Have you ever considered a civil suit against him? Because he's gone on to make movies. You know, I know he's not a millionaire. I, I don't know what his net worth is, but it's just not fair that he's gone on to have this successful career, you know, and you've been left to pick up the pieces. Uh, well, if I'm going to be completely honest, I mean, there are there have been times where I've wondered, you know, if there's some way to, um, you know, if that was even a possibility, but I, I had no, you know, I have no idea of statute of limitations and what they have, the laws have changed in California. And um, honestly, I don't, I don't want his blood money. I don't, you know, yeah. right. I, I have enough talent and ability to make a contribution and make a living that that's what I've pursued. I haven't pursued any kind of like revenge money, or anything like that, you know. And again, I have never once badmouthed him or like said, you know, he should be cast. I've like never said anything like remotely even close to that. I've never even said that he shouldn't be allowed to work anymore in Hollywood. I've just said he should not be allowed to be around children or to make movies by you know from companies that are all the money's coming from children. Absolutely, like that's where, that's where I've fought. I'm not here to stop him from working. I'm here to stop him from being having access to children. How was the feedback once the, uh, your documentary came out? Uh, I haven't heard any, actually. Nothing? No. Um, that's kind of a weird situation. Uh, okay. It took so long for the documentary to come out. It took so long, and there was so much um, yeah. trauma involved because of the wolf pack and all that bullshit with Corey Feldman that mm -hmm. and then like right as I was starting to pick up speed, like Isaac Caffey came out and started blowing his mouth off. And like, so it was like, you know, again, I have no, nothing against Isaac Caffey. I have nothing, you know, it's, it's just that something has always come along to draw attention away from me and what right. I'm trying to do. So it's again, just another instance of the attention that I was starting to get being drawn somewhere else. And so by the time it took two years for the documentary to finally, you know, because of, you know, um, creative differences and disagreements with the director and um, the drama involved with social media and me just being, yeah, I'm not that way. I don't, I'm not a gossiper. I don't get involved in any kind of disputes like that. You know, right. I don't, I don't, and start talking about things that I don't know about. And I don't, I just don't want to get involved. And it left a really bad taste in my mouth, um, you know, because there's always going to be people out there that want to put me down and want to say that I'm this and I'm that and I'm, just like Corey Feldman is the newest one, of course, you know, and uh, 
Well, so I kind of just dropped out. I've been systematically kind of just dropping out. Yeah. Of the well, well, you're back. On the and and for, hold on, yeah. Therese, let's talk about that for a quick second because there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to say, oh, well, you have Nathan on, but you don't want Feldman to make a documentary and you've been, you know, going against him for two and a half years, Susie. So how can you have somebody like Nathan on? Well, first of all, Nathan didn't ask for $10 million to speak up and to name pedophiles in Hollywood. He did it. He had the courage to do it as a 12 year old child and then came forward again as a young adult and went to where anywhere he could to tell his story and what he went through as a child. So just to put that to um, rest, but um, Nathan, like, honestly, this is the first time I've had a chance to really talk to you. I know everybody knows, and you know, <clears throat> I was really close with Bobby as far as the Feldman stuff. I did not get involved with Monster Hunters at all, zero. I know Sharice did. That was your guys' thing. I supported it from a distance, um, and it was a really great thing, and... Like, what's your thoughts on how Feldman approached this whole thing, asking for the $10 million for the movie and everything like that's gone on now? Here we are two and a half years later and we still don't have the documentary. Can You don't have to go in detail about it, but I just know people are going to, you know, the comment section will be blown up with stuff like this. So I just figured we might as well discuss it briefly. I would hope that people would use common sense and, and you know, like basically just, you know, look look at the, the two situations. Other than having a very shortly run GoFundMe campaign, I have never asked for one thing. Never once have I asked. In fact, I have turned down every single offer that's ever been given to me. Okay? Like when I was 20 and I did uh, uh, an interview on Geraldo Rivera on CNBC, Geraldo Rivera literally had to beg me to tell him the name of my band because my re my reaction and answer to that his question of what is my band name, I was I'm not here to talk about my band or promote my band. I'm here to raise awareness and stop child abuse. So it's really irrelevant. I'm not here to plug my band. Okay, I've never sought out any kind of fame or money or anything else, and that's all. You know, the proof is in the pudding. Okay, I spent my pocket to make this documentary. It has cost me emotionally like no one would believe, okay? And I have done nothing. My story has never once changed. I've never backtracked. I've never, I've never slandered anyone, okay? I've defamed anyone. I've never said anything that wasn't true or to, could be proven. Never. Right. And Feldman done. So if you look at those two side by side, I think it's, the picture is pretty, pretty clear. And that's what's so offensive to me. That's what's so offensive to me that people would say something like that about me. Because I've done nothing but prove my integrity and honesty throughout since I was 12 years old. So, you know, I would ask people to at least, you know, use some common sense and, and the power reduction and look at the two situations and, and then make a decision about what they're going to say. Well, and Nathan, we're going to work to back on track, and we have a lot of things coming. You know, we're, we support Nathan 100%. Everything's back on track. His website's going to be up and running again, and just look for a lot of great things coming because, Nathan, nobody's going to be silencing you anymore. It's do you over. feel like when you and Bobby were doing the Monster Hunters, do you feel like people were – attacking you and slandering you and making up lies about you because I certainly um, felt that way that that was being done to you and Bobby and I think many other people did. Do you think it was because you guys had something going there and people were threatened by it or do you think that, you know, Maybe I Feldman, you know, we know Feldman set out people to harass us and stalk us, and he didn't want you guys to have a platform because he wants to be the only, you know, voice. Yeah. I um, I can't say who's behind the curtain. Right. Um, because that's just speculation at this point. But I do know that um, throughout my life, I had, <clears throat> I'd had, like, if it, you know, 
I've, it, I've felt like I have been prevented. And I don't know who's pulling the strings, but I know that um, with as hard as I've worked and how genuine I am and the content that I have, um, I shouldn't be met with such resistance and such, you know, like hate from people because it's really, you know, for me personally, it's, it's a no brainer. Like if you listen to me talk, if you hear what I have to say, it's pretty clear that like, I'm no, nothing like Corey Feldman for one thing, but it's pretty clear that what my mission is and what my goals are and the fact that I'm not asking for anything. So, right. you know, it, it, I think what I would attribute most of it to is a lack of, uh, it's laziness, people being unwilling to actually go and find out what, what the real deal is. They just take what they're told, and that's the gospel. So that's, you know, that's what they go and start spewing out to everybody else without any kind of knowledge or background on what's really happening. And that's what I attribute right. most of it to, is just people being lazy or, you know, ignorant and not being like, you know, sheep and just being fed the lies and, you know, choking on truth, but easily swallowing down all the lies. Yeah, well, I just want to go ahead and I want to apologize for everything that you guys went through because, you know, um, I know I had never spoken to you, but just being friends with Bobby and the slander and everything else and just trying to, um, you know, destroy what you guys had, I know it took a toll on both of you emotionally, physically, and um, everything else. And, you know, it's yeah, I mean, really it's sad. Monster Hunters was an idea, a concept I had, you know, years ago where I wanted to make, a, you know, some, a platform for victims and survivors to come and break their silence. You yeah. know, the name of my campaign was Taking Action, Breaking Silence, tabs, you know, and then it's kind of like a double meaning because it's like taking, keeping tabs on these people, on these pedophiles, these predators, but it's also taking action, breaking silence because that's one of the first steps to on that road to recovery and to, to surviving to become a survivor is is taking action and calling out your victimizer and and breaking that silence and so that's what monster hunters was always was to me was a place where what i wanted it to be was a place where victims and survivors could come tell their stories exactly right. what you would ask me earlier in the show susie as you know would i interview and that's what monster hunters was was the idea behind it was a place where it'd be safe and you could come talk to someone that has lived it and been through it and and known it most of my life and you know Bobby's a great guy and very compassionate and you know and him and I just clicked and right was, and know. that's that's another thing I don't think people like really understand because I know just getting involved with the Corey Feldman stuff just started with me making a couple of tweets about my experience when I met him and me being disgusted he asked for 10 million dollars and the next thing I know it you know, developed into what it developed. And I didn't know what I was doing. And same thing happened with Bobby, right? Well, he sat down, recorded a video about his thoughts about it. And the next thing he blew up and then he wanted to do something bigger and met you. And like, I think we weren't, and I'm not speaking for you at all. Cause I don't, and you had experience in this field. Um, like Bobby was in over his head. I was in over my head. We were learning as we were going, and then like all these attacks and craziness happened, and um, you know, it was finally like you know, Bobby for his own emotional and mental stability just said, you know what, I, I gotta, I gotta walk away from this, and he didn't want to. It killed him to, um, you know, not only with Feldman, but especially with Monster Hunters, because he felt like he was doing something good, but people were trying to turn it into something so bad constantly 24 seven. It, you know, finally, you know, got to him. And, you know, I know as far as the Feldman stuff, he was like, you know, we did everything that we could do. We've said everything that's needed to be said. And, you know, that's a wrap. And, uh, you know, same thing, you know, with uh, monster hunters and, it's just really upsetting that when, you know, I think people need to learn to cut people a little bit more slack and take into consideration that we were, you know, all learning as things were going on. And, um, you know, people need to support each other more often than trying to constantly tear each other apart and down. And Oh, yeah. And Nathan, you know, we let a year and a half go by of just 
being stagnant and getting absolutely nothing done. And I'm just so glad that you and I have put the past in the past and we're taking this step to move forward. You know, because you need to be heard, Nathan, you know, and we've wasted enough time. We have absolutely wasted enough time. And the fact yeah, that not one celebrity has has stood by you, it, it's very disgusting because these people are making a huge platform for the, for themselves. But it's not a true platform. If you can't embrace the first man to get a conviction against a, a Hollywood pedophile, that's still in the industry, then you're a hypocrite. I'm sorry, you're a hypocrite. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. Yeah. You know? Um, just, Heather Danielle, Nathan, I don't know if you've ever spoken to her on Twitter. She's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful soul. She is a survivor of abuse. And she said, Nathan, I would love to collaborate with you one day. I am a survivor too and have the same passion. Plus, I do miss Monster Hunters. Bobby is a great guy. Um, I think she would be an excellent person for you to um, connect with. Don't you, Cherise? Oh, sure. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, she doesn't do the drama. She doesn't, you know. See, that's my whole thing, too. A big part of what, you know, I, how I feel about this is and, and the way that um, we sort of operate, like, as, as victims and survivors, it, and, and this is, comes from Bobby, actually. He's the one that put this, put it this way, is that it's like it, everyone's turned feral out there. And, and they've all, like, they're just all so ready to just turn on each other and, and at the, any sign of, like, any kind of disagreement. And for me, personally, and Sharice, I know you've heard me say this, that this is a job and you leave your personal shit at the door. I mean, if you disagree with somebody or you don't like somebody's personality or what they have to say outside of this topic that we're working on, then you leave it at the door and you still go to work with that person because that's how it's supposed to be. You know, this is not, this is much bigger than my personal feelings or my opinions of anybody. Way bigger than that. Okay. So as far as like letting your emotions or your feelings uh, dictate whether or not you're going to continue this good fight, then that's just to me is cowardice. Like, you know, I, I, I haven't, I don't mean to be so harsh, but you know, I kind of I'm at the limit of shit, you know, personally. And it's <laughs> like, you know, leave it at the door and go to work. Because you know what? If you don't go to work and you don't go help, how do you know that you know how many children could be abused because you decided not to go to work because you disagree with that person? You know? I think we all need to step up and start being adults and act like adults. Because this whole social media thing that you know, like that's ridiculous. We're not in junior high. We're not in high school. Okay. And like literally our future is dependent on this because if we continue to turn our backs on our children, what do you think it's going to be like, you know, in 20 years? All right. Well, and that's what I wanted to ask you too. Earlier, we were talking about um, the warning signs of kids. Can you talk about what, you know, warning signs us parents should look out for? Um, yeah, I mean, they will, you know, like very early signs are like disassociation um, or like emotional, like their emotions um, either going one way or the other, you know, way extreme or not enough, uh, one direction or the other, depression, um, their appetite. Uh, the eating habits eating will change. Um, you know, little kids eight years old not you should not be talking about suicide. Okay, that's like a big one right there. It's a huge red flag that something really serious is going on. You know, and I, I tried to kill myself for the first time at seven. Oh my god. Wow. I really tried to hang myself from the tree in the front yard and it was a dead tree and so the branch broke. But wow. Oh I mean god. those, you know so you know, th there's several I mean there's plenty of uh, literature out there and, you know, people that do seminars and that's something that I've been looking into for the last couple of years too, is like, you know, doing speaking tours and, and my biggest thing is I don't know how to, I don't know how to set all that up. I don't know how to arrange all that. It's like, I have all the ideas, but I don't know how to like do it. You know, I, I didn't know how to start Monster Hunter, you know, and 
I just, I, it's like I get the, I, the ideas, but I don't necessarily know how to, to put them into action all the time. And so, you know, but the, it's not, doesn't mean that the, that information isn't available readily. You know, you just have to look for it. Again, it's, it's like that's the kind of stuff that's suppressed and kept from being out there openly for everybody to just go easily click on and find. You know, it's like you might actually have to do some research and do a little bit looking, but it's out there and, you know, it's available. And so I, I encourage people to do just that. All right. Well, um, thank you for sharing that. Scott Kurt is in the um, chat room. Um, he said, apparently I was on Monster Hunters too and had nothing but love for Nathan. The survivor story was mine and the only one there ever was. Um, I'm not sure I know what that means. And I think he said above that, what do you say? Somebody, um, he got hit in at first. Um, Nathan should talk to me because I did nothing but support him. And I'm not, I don't know, again, I don't know the history there because everybody always thinks that I was Bobby's right hand person and told Bobby, you know, everything to do. But I think you, Sharice, and Scott could all agree that I literally had zilch to do with Monster Hunters. Right. Um, so, like, yeah. I don't know all the history there or anything like that. And, um, you know, I, I honestly was not a part of that. Can I just say, I appreciate the gesture, Scott, but I don't think that this is necessarily the, the place to be, like, trying to, you know, bring it all out like that. I mean, yeah, yeah, maybe you guys connect, um, connect privately and, Nathan, and uh, you know, from um, there. But much has happened in all judging time. And maybe, you know, uh, maybe part of it was that some of us were triggered just from the subject, just from the topic, you know, but yeah. I mean, I know personally, I have grown yeah. a lot. I was just going to say, I, I absolutely understand that. And I yeah. You know, and, and we try to do this with so a I, lot of Hold on, I can't hear. For me, sure. for me hold I'm on. not somebody that has ever, like, kind of held back. You know, I, I'm just, for me, it's not, I, I can talk about it as if I'm talking about Oh, I know. Without any like shame. Right. You talk about it with everyone, no shame. Not everyone had their, their life and their abuse aired out since they were 12 years old for everybody to know about and talk right. about. Okay? I'm kind of exclusive in that exactly. regard. I understand that, that and, I, and I apologize because I don't mean to be like, I don't, I just, I guess for me, it's just such a, a natural and, and familiar thing that I, I forget that it's not like that for everybody else. And I, I completely understand that's the same way when I talk about, you know, losing my mom and my sister and everybody I lost in my life. People are always like, but I've talked about it so much in my whole life and I shared the story. You know, it's, it's, I, I, all I'm trying to say is I completely understand where you're coming from. And, you know, I do think, you know, uh, talking about a subject like this is um, a thin line a lot and it brings up, you know, old stuff and it's a, you know, it's a very serious issue and people's emotions are running high and then you deal with just your normal day stress. And then when you got a tax happening on you and everything else. So, um, you know, right. I think it, it, it was a learning experience for all of us. And if it's brought us to where we are today, right now, sitting here discussing it and even something better comes out of it moving forward, and you know, then in my eyes, it was all worth it. You know, um, everything the, happens the for process. a reason. Yes, it was part of the learning process. Correct. You know, we've learned what not to do, Nathan. <laughs> we've learned what uh, not yeah. to do. <laughs> nothing else. Nothing else. You can always learn from the, you know, and. Um, so well, again, Nathan, I, I, if you I, want to let gone. everybody know where they can find your documentary. Say that again. You want to let everybody know where they want to watch your documentary, where they can go to um, find it and look at it and see it. Honestly, um, and I know this sounds horrible, but I, I don't remember. I, I, I've only been to the site where it's up for sale. Um, Connor did all that. And I haven't spoken with Connor since probably, I don't know, Thanksgiving. Um, so I'm not, okay. I'm not really sure. 
Well, Nathan and I will will be talking about you know, getting it, you know, for sale on his website. Yeah. So. That's well, yeah, um, and I'll. Uh, I wanted it to be available, um, and you know, it was like a, it was like literally, you know, just scraping to figure out how we're going to do this with Connor and I because we had no money, no budget for anything. So it was like, and nobody backing us really either. Um, you know, no distributors wanted to, you know, get involved. Nobody wanted to touch it. So, you know, we just like, we have to get out. People are like still, you know, like what the hell is going on? And this long, why isn't the movie available? And so it was just like, okay, we're just going to do it on Halloween. And Connor put it up and, you know, it's not as if Connor and I had a falling out. It's just that, you know, life can, you can get wrapped up in life real easy and, right. and buy before you know it. And so that's kind of this in, the situation is that, you know, I haven't really checked and I haven't spoken to Connor and, and I've kind of just put that on the back burner, hoping that, you know, something's going to come along or I'll figure something out to, to make it more readily available in a, you know, in an easier way. So. Yeah, now I can, um, I'll, when this is done, I'll try to find the link to where people can purchase it and I can put it in the description. Or what's your website? I'll add that to the description of this video too. But if we can let the people in the chat know. Well, after we, we put it back up. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's been down. okay. Sorry. I, I didn't know. We're going to build it. <laughs> We're going to build it, Susie. Susie, <laughs> Susie if, you, if you search my profile on Facebook, um, around you know the beginning of October, there or the end of October, there's links to where where it's at available. That posted okay. on my on my on my profile. So, okay, yes, I'll definitely um, put it in the description. Does anybody have any more questions, Sharice or the chat or Nathan? Do you have any questions for us or any other? Well, I just I just have one more comment, and the thing is, you know, Nathan. I just, I truly believe that, you know, there's been this whole campaign about exposing Harvey Weinstein and everybody's talking about, you know, taking back this power and exposing this sexual predator. But at the same time, it's very, very obvious that there's another hierarchy that Francis Ford Coppola has been keeping everybody away from you. And it, he might not be doing it directly, but they know that he was behind this suit. They know that he supported Salva and they're, they're still afraid. And it's just, um, we have to make some noise, you know, cause I'm sick of this. You know, we've seen a lot of high powered people get exposed in the past year and a half. You know, there's been the leaving Neverland documentary. There's been R Kelly. There's been Weinstein's on trial now. Jeffrey Epstein's exposed. Yet, why is Salva still in Hollywood? Why, well, yeah, are, why, is, nobody, why is nobody standing up for you? you know, I live an hour from L.A. now, and if I were to get my kids into, you know, if I was, let's say I moved out to L.A. and I wanted my kids to be actors, I would have had no idea about that guy. I honestly wouldn't have. So we definitely need to... Um, work on, you know, bringing awareness. And I guess that leads me to a question Mary B just asked in the chat. She said, what are Nathan's plans moving forward in a perfect world? Nathan, well, what are your plans moving forward? And like, what are your goals as far as when it comes to your documentary and your story? Or well, with the documentary, I, um, I would like it to be more readily available, uh, and this is something I have to work out with Connor as far as the agreements we've made, uh, which is you know probably the biggest reason it's not up on YouTube or something. Um, and you know, music is is my it's it's my savior, and it's my it's it's what has uh, literally like kept me with my head above water in some of the darkest times I've ever had. And so I I will continue to play my music and write music and. And, um, you know, I, I scored my documentary myself. And so that's something I've always wanted to do. So I'm, you know, and as far as, you know, continue to, to be an advocate, I will continue to, you know, answer the call anytime I hear it. And, you know, I'm looking into, like, again, I want to do speaking tours and other things that I want to do like that, that will help to raise awareness and to continue to educate and, um, you know, I mean, I have, I'm a very big picture person, so I have 
like all these ideas and things that could be done to kind of, you know, give us more of a fighting chance. Because as I see it right now, this is kind of a bleak um, perspective, but it's also not just completely outrageous, is that so many of the powers that be in this world that are controlling things and have the money and have the, the you know, the networking group, you know, it's like they know how to network, you know, they know how to watch each other's backs. They know, you know, they don't go and paddle on each other unless it's absolutely somebody just messed up so bad that they have to throw them out there or if they need a scapegoat or something. Other than that, it's just like Coppola with Victor. They protect each other. They network. Okay, and unfortunately, they have a lot of money, a lot of yep. influence. They're influencing what our children watch. They're influencing what we watch. They, you know, it's like we need to start as as survivors and victims. These nonprofit organizations. We need to all learn how to work together, regardless of our opinions of each other. We need to learn how to work together, network, and you know, I know that we could we could we could turn the tide, but it's gonna it's gonna require us all to kind of suck it up a little bit you know, and work together and find a way to work together. That's what I really, what I push for the most when I talk is that this unity. And that's my only, to go back a little bit to what when Sharif asked me, what I thought of the, the Me Too movement, I think it's wonderful. And I, I praise them. I give them all the, you know, more power to them. What I disagree with is the division. There should be no exactly. division between any victim or survivor. We are all in this together, so there should be no division. We should be working together and coordinating together to do everything we can to, to stop it, to battle it. And that's what it's going to take. So that's what I will continue to do from here on out. It's what I've been doing. It's what I will do until I take my, my last breath. Amen to that. Um, Percy, and I'm actually curious, too, and I was going to ask where they could find it. Um, I did not know about your music, and Kelly had told me today that she had listened to some of it, and it, she said it was absolutely amazing. Um, Percy's asking, what kind of music do you play, and is there? do you have a YouTube channel where your music's at, or where, is that something you're want, you would put on your website also, or where could people find your music? Um, as of now, it's, it's, um, Sharice, you can probably type this in the comments because I don't know how to do it, but, um, the name of my, my music project is the seven stone and the, the, the T and the is a seven. Um, and I'm on a site called reverb nation. So it's just reverbnation.com backslash the seven stone. And then on SoundCloud and the same thing for YouTube and, um, you know, everything I do is on a no budget budget. So it's not like I have, it's you know, the greatest sound quality or video quality or it's all done by me. I do all the instruments, you know, other than in some of it, my bass player is there. But other than that, I do. It's all me. And um, same with the videos that I have up. So, you know, bear in mind, it's not I, the greatest quality as far as the picture and the sound. But, you know, I believe that the essence and, the, and my heart is in it. And that's what would attract people to it, I guess. But it's, yeah, it's, it's available, just not a whole lot of it because, you know, um, I have way more than I than I can put out right now because it's just it starts piling up on me. But yeah. Oh well, yeah, and I would love to hear it, and um, you know, maybe because I'm trying to work up on my channel and build it and do certain things and. I mean, even with your permission, maybe I would, you know, if you gave me the green light, I would even play it, you know, as far as, you know, an intro or something like that. But that's, again, something that we can uh, dis sure. discuss I mean, I mean, behind I mean, this. It's like, for me, um, you know, somebody, he'd asked, or they had asked uh, what kind of music it is. And, and it's hard to, like, really put a, a pinpoint on it because... It, it can vary. Like I, there's electronic instrumental dubstep type stuff that I love to do. And I love to play heavy, heavy music, you know, with distorted guitars. And, and I just got a drum set. A friend gave me his electronic drum set for Christmas. So like, I'm starting to play drums again for the first time in decades. And that's my first. What kind of guitar do you play? Um, well, I, I pretty much stick to acoustic guitar. I have an old okay. late 70s Yamaha that I love, Sunburst Yamaha. Um, but I love playing heavy music too, like with electric guitars and distortion and all that, you know, like, um, 
I like hip hop. I mean, I do, I, I dabble a little bit in everything. And then I kind of have my own stuff too, my own kind of like this kind of Russian gypsy music that I, I you know, kind of just came out of nowhere a couple of years ago and started writing I mean, that kind of, uh, that kind of genre. So. I'm going to put That was up. awesome. Do you uh, know the... Sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you, Strace. Do you know the company D-Drums? D-Drums? They make drums. D-Drums, I think is what it's called. Like D as in... Uh, D as in drums. It's, uh, oh, yeah, I used to work for Washburn Guitars when I was 19 to 21. Um, I worked at Washburn Guitars and... Somebody in my, he's actually an ex-boyfriend of mine. Um, he went on and he worked for a guitar case company, Alligator something. And now I believe he works for a company. It's D and then drums, just the letter D and then drums. I'm seeing on his uh, social media. So just curious. That might, to that. Uh, that it sounds, I think it might be DW drums maybe. Uh, or affiliated oh, uh, Yeah, you probably know. I know about Washburn. I don't know about the drums. <laughs> yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but I do know that um, Drumworks or DW um, kind of switched switch owners or something happened with them just recently. So that could be what it is that I'm remembering. But um, I, yeah, I, ha I haven't really been too involved in like, I used to be a gearhead, you know, where I wanted to know all the new stuff and like, but I haven't really had the, you know, the time or the desire to be in that kind of a mindset since I, um, you know, I used to work for Guitar Center for a long time. So oh, okay. that kind of made me have, it required me to be all up on the new stuff. So, but, you know, I, I'm just one of those meat and potatoes kind of guys. It's, you know, I mean, I've been, you know, grown up without a lot of money. And as an adult, I, you know, haven't ever really had the opportunity to have like really nice, good equipment. So it's always like kind of just scraping the bottom of the barrel kind of stuff or what somebody would give me you know again like a friend gave me this electronic drum set and so you know i just if you give me something you know like if i have an instrument i will make it work that's just how you know but i don't require a whole lot of you know like i'm a meat and potatoes kind of guy so that's what i just you know i just think that's what i got um Sharice, that link that you just put in the chat is that uh nathan's youtube channel or is that a just a it's video. a video. It's Nathan, oh, okay. Nathan playing, um, Paint It Black by the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Scott Kurt just said, Nathan does a good cover of The Killing Moon by Echo and the Bunny Men. Exactly. It's actually Nothing Lasts Forever by, by Echo and the Bunny Men. But yeah, yeah. I love that song. Well, awesome. Um, all right. Well, uh, Sharice, you said your final thoughts, right? Or did you? Oh, yeah. I'm done. I said my final thoughts. Nathan, I'm is there this else? again, but <laughs> I keep hearing that I'm, I'm roboting. Oh, I don't hear you roboting. Um, Nathan, do you have anything else to say? I just I appreciate all the support, and um, I'll continue to do my best. And I, you know, I encourage, like I said, I encourage everyone to. To not just take what they hear and and you know to actually put the time and put some time in and um then make their decisions on how they feel about things you know to, to not to not allow the influence because the truth is is the influence that we're being given that is being pressed upon us since we're born by you know tv and movies and all these celebrities and just you know, all these you know um it's really not serving us. It's really not. It's serving the people that own these companies and they're stacking all up this money and, you know, and suppressing the truth from being out there. So, you know, mm -hmm. don't, don't just let, don't be led. Go, go seek it yourself. And, and, you know, if you find someone that you feel like is doing something that's good and that you believe in, then support them. And, you know, I just encourage people to, to um, take it, take action upon themselves. And and you know, work together. That's that's really where it comes down to. Is, is you know we need to work together because I do believe we can make a difference, and I do believe that you know just one voice can be heard and can make a difference, and can rally up an army of people that want to stop this and do Amen. it the right way. Do it the right way. 
Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, I look forward to talking to you more behind the scenes and with Sharice and, um, you know, we can see what we can do moving forward. Um, you know, I have this platform here and I, you know, been you and kind of had this channel on hold while I was on another channel. And I just had this channel sitting because I wanted to decide what exactly I was going to do with the platform that I have. And it, you know, it seems to be growing each more each day. So um, I would love to talk to you more and see what we can do moving forward and possibly working together and raising, you know, awareness and sharing, you know, not only my story, but maybe other people's stories. So, and I want to thank you so much for everything that you've done. It takes, you know, a, when I want to salute you, it took a lot of courage and, um, you know, the world needs more, you know, not only men, but people like you in it, Nathan. And I wish I would have gotten to know you <laughs> Back a year ago when uh, you were, you know, had everything going on. But, you know, again, everything happens for a reason. And now, you know, we've been brought together. So um, just really want to thank you for coming on here. And, you know, it's been an honor to being able to talk to you. Well, thank you, Susie. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity as well. Thank All right. Know. Yes, thank well, you, Nathan. <laughs> um, thank you. And... Nathan's PayPal has been put out through the chat for anybody that's watching this back on replay. And it will, it's also in the description of the video. And we will, as soon as his website is up and running again, I will put the link to his website and to his music. Thank you, Cherise, for being on here. Thank you to everybody in the chat. And I have a real strong feeling we'll be all chatting again sometime soon. So... Thanks. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.